moderator, who is Dr. Inra Becerra Fernandez, who is the Vice President for Engagement for Florida International University. And she will introduce our speaker, Robert Blaine, so I will leave that to her. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Guy Mice, thank you for the opportunity to introduce our webinar presenter today, Dr. Robert Blaine. Dr. Blaine is currently serving as a special assistant to the Provost for Cyber Learning at Jackson State University and is also Interim Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Professor of Music and Director of Orchestral Studies at Jackson State, Director of the Global Education Through Analytical Reasoning, also known as GEAR, the Artistic Director of the Mississippi Youth Symphony, and host of the television program Music Art on the Colors Network in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Dr. Blaine, I don't know how you do these many jobs. I thought I had a lot of jobs, but I think you beat me. Uh, Dr. Blaine is an internationally known conductor and soloist and has led ensembles in China, Central America, the Caribbean, and throughout North America. Dr. Blaine is an Apple Distinguished Educator, which makes him part of a group of educational leaders that are using Apple products to do extraordinary things both in and beyond the classroom. Which brings us to the topic of today's presentation. In fall 2012, Jackson State University implemented its iPad scholarship program, which gave an iPad to each entering freshman. I am so excited to hear about this program. And so without further hesitation, please welcome Dr. Robert Blaine. Dr. Blaine, on to you. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to um, talk a little bit about our iPad initiative here at the university and um, also give you some kind of insight into what we're doing um, in the future with our program. So I think I have control of the screen now. And you do, Robert. Great. So um, we started our initiative um, that actually about four years ago. And our program is called, um, we're actually looking at how institutional transformation, how do we change the nature of what we do at the university. And so um, when we first started, we actually started as a part of um, reaccreditation. Um, I was the uh, QEP director for our university. And um, we first started as part of the Q, as part of the quality enhancement plan. Um, we the first thing that we wanted to do was look at a program that focused on student learning objectives and thinking skills, um, fundamental skills first, looking at reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and then higher level thinking skills, analytical reasoning skills, the way, the way that students start to look above discipline material and begin to make the connections between the disciplines. And so what we quickly realized was that we were asking, I'm going backwards here, a really fundamental question, which is what's the role of our institution in a world where information is ubiquitous? When information is everywhere, how does, what's the, how does the role of higher education change? And so part of the quality enhancement plan, as I said before, focused on these student learning objectives, foundational skills and higher level thinking skills. So the first thing that we had to do was look at teaching, um, what we do with our faculty and what our faculty do in the classroom. And so we had to give them the requisite skills in order to be able to um, answer this question, um, this big question that we were asking. And so we developed a summer seminar called GIFTS, the Global Inquiry Faculty Teaching Seminar. And in this seminar, I brought faculty members in for um, one complete summer session. So they were working for a month from 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we used a set of global questions, um, what we called analytical exercises. These large questions about the world that were very analytical in nature. And we used them as the framework to talk about the material in the discipline. So um, you can look at world water shortages, but you can look at that from the standpoint of the art that's created from it. You can look at the sociology of it. You can look at the uh, mathematics of what they're doing to try and find water in places. You can talk about the history of it, what's happened in the world. Um, uh, all of these different 
ways of looking at one topic that give you each one gives you a different perspective of the topic, and when you look at the topic in whole, it gives you a, a better picture of the whole pic of the of the whole idea, the whole topic. And so that was the step to move us towards those higher level thinking process processes, those analytical uh, analytical the analytical process and analytical thinking. So. Um, what the faculty did during this gift seminar was that they actually produced their own textbook. They redeveloped their course based on our two student learning objectives and they produced their own digital textbook. Um, and so we focused on very high quality content that was based on our curricular goals. Um, and then once the faculty implemented their newly developed curriculum in the classroom, that became known as GEAR, Global Education Through Analytical Reasoning. And this was all, again, part of our um, QEP, um, part of a reaffirmation, part of the Quality Enhancement Plan. And so when we began to um, institute this curriculum, uh, this was four years ago. So when we put it into the classroom, we were using a bring your own device strategy, a BYOD strategy. And what that meant for us was that we had some students that had smartphones that they could use to had enough memory to hold these digital books that we were producing. And then we had some, maybe one or two students in a class that actually had an iPad because they were brand, brand new then. Um, we had a bunch of students that, if you remember back, had those old flip phones that didn't have enough memory to hold the book on it, so we would house the book on an external website and the students would link to the book during class. And then we had some students that had absolutely nothing. So we handed them a paper copy of the text and um, of course the paper copy had none of the ways that we were trying to expand the curriculum. So these digital books had um, external web links, they had embedded video, they had all of these ways that we were working to expand the curriculum. and what we began to see was that we saw um, analytical reasoning scores go up across the board by a measure of a little bit over 16 percent. But if you look at the right side of the graph, those are represented by students that were, um, that actually had access to the technology so they could really take advantage of the, um, of the increases that we were making in the curriculum. And the ones on the left are actually represented more by students who didn't have the technology to be able to um, to be able to really take advantage of this learning uh, this increased learning environment and so what we saw was that we were starting to create our own digital divide we were giving to the haves and we were increasing learning outcomes for the students that have and then the have-nots were getting left behind and so that led to our findings which basically said that we needed to provide a, a floor of access for all of our students. Um, this digital divide that we were starting to create internally um, had to, the only way that we could really solve the problem is if we made sure that every student had access to the curriculum. And so that gave into, in, um, the impetus for us to develop what we called the democratization of cyber learning. And so it's a one-to-one -one initiative that puts mobile technology in the hands of every student. So uh, the first thing that we had to do is we had to find a way to pay for it. Um, it wasn't cheap. And, um, so, and also state law here demands that we can't purchase technology with state funds and then give it to students. Uh, there was a university uh, here that tried to do something like that with uh, some other devices and the president and provost had to step down. So we were not going to get caught up in that. So what we did was we created, we have this partnership with uh, the Mississippi E-Center, which is a private 5013C and it exists for the benefit of the university but it's private funds. So um, that facility is an entrepreneurship mall and it, they um, they turn a profit every year. And so we um, partnered with the eCenter. Um, the eCenter actually purchased the technology and then um, the technology was given to students as scholarships. So 
the program that we came up with was called TASI, the Technology Advantage Scholarship Initiative. So uh, the technology is purchased by the eCenter. Um, the students do not actually own the iPads, at least not for two years. So what we do is we depreciate the value of the device over two years, and at the end of two years, um, the, the device is depreciated down to zero, so it rolls off the inventory of the eCenter and becomes the uh, property of the student. So um, if a student remains enrolled for four consecutive semesters, the um, iPad transfers from the tech from the eCenter to become the property of the student. And the only thing that our students pay is $50 for insurance. So if anything happens to the device, they drop it, um, it gets wet and something happens to it, um, even if it's stolen or if anything happens, they bring the damaged device or a police report back to us and we hand them a brand new device. We file the insurance claim and we get the a device replaced later on, but the student is not out of the having the device in their classes. And so all the information that they use is, is uh, stored in cloud storage. So literally they hit one or two buttons and all of their information downloads right back onto the device again. So um, in order to implement this strategy, um, we had to make some pretty substantial uh, investments in our infrastructure, our wireless infrastructure. And so we had a kind of a legacy system. It was it had been added to over several years and we said that we had wireless across campus but it was it was pretty spotty so you would be in one classroom situation and not be able to really get a good signal and then be across the hallway and get a great signal so what we did was we tore out our entire wireless infrastructure and started all over again with a, a brand new Cisco system we invested 1.4 million dollars in wireless and we began with our teaching spaces that first year. Um, we focused on the teaching spaces where freshman courses were being taught because the technology, um, the uh, TASI scholarship, um, applies to first-time freshmen. So it's a cohort-based system, and it moves with each freshman class. So, um, so we started with the teaching spaces where we knew all those freshman courses were being taught. Um, we moved to the, and then we completed the rest of the teaching spaces in the first um, first semester of the first year. This is would have been 2011 now, um, actually 2012. I'm sorry. Then uh, we moved to the living spaces because once you have students working this way, they have to be able to access from their dorm rooms. So um, all the dorms now have. Um, ubiquitous access, and then finally uh, the green spaces around campus. So now a student can get uh, complete wireless anywhere, um, anywhere on campus. Um, and then we had to expand what we were doing uh, from GIFs. GIFs brought in 12 to 15 faculty members per semester, per summer rather. So um, with GIFs over the past four years, We've done a little bit over 40 faculty members, but we have over 500 faculty members in the university. So once we started with the complete freshman class, um, we had to have a new strategy for how we were going to teach with technology. And so we started this new program with all of the faculty teaching freshman courses, the, the Gen Ed core. So we were looking at five courses that we focused on. First, university success. Every incoming freshman takes this course. Uh, Math 111, English 104, English Literature, History 101, and Biology 101. So those were the five Gen Ed core courses that we focused on. All of the faculty um, teaching those courses, it was a little bit uh, just under 100 faculty members. Uh, we purchased iPads for it, and they all went through uh, teaching with technology training and the, each one of the faculty members had to write what we called their teaching with technology strategy we didn't want to be I didn't want to be prescriptive and tell faculty members how they had to teach um, I gave them a set of teaching tools that they could use and they could pick and choose um, but they had to say and describe how they were going to use that in their um, in their teaching in the classroom and that teaching with technology strategy focused on student engagement, 
expansion of the classroom learning environment, integration and development of primary source material, and most importantly, the extension of teaching practices that moved beyond the traditional lecture format. One of the things that we really wanted to focus on was an environment of active learning in the classroom and using technology as a vehicle to have students doing hands-on learning rather than moving from the old uh, example of what I like to call preaching and sleeping. So one person preaching and a, a bunch of people sleeping. So um, once we did that, we started um, to move to some other initiatives. So the first thing that we looked at was a pilot with Educause. And that was in the spring of uh, last year. Uh, what we did was we piloted uh, using digital textbooks, embedding them in the LMS that we use, the Learning Management System, which is Blackboard here. So um, the Educause pilot took five courses and um, a thousand students. And what we did was we pre-purchased textbooks for all of those courses and embedded those into Blackboard. So what happened was that as soon as a student came to class on the first day, they went to their Blackboard course listing, um, they pressed one book and their textbook downloaded automatically onto their iPad. And one of the issues that we had with uh, students is that we have over 90% of our students that are on some kind of financial aid. And what that means for us is that students will often wait until they receive refund checks to purchase materials for classes. Um, our textbook costs are, are pretty high. So those five gen ed courses that I was talking about, um, the textbook cost alone for those five courses is over $1,200 for students. And that presents a, a pretty substantial barrier for our students. And so what we've seen in the data shows for uh, for most of our students is that we see really low levels of student investment in the beginning of courses, generally because they don't have the materials, they're borrowing, sharing, trying to get access to the information, but they really don't have their own. And then once students purchase materials, which, is, which can be as long as three or four weeks into the semester, really, really high rates of student investments where students are working very hard to try and now learn a semester's worth of material in basically half a semester. So with the Educause pilot, we wanted to see what would happen if we embedded all the materials into the course from the very first day. This was part of that democratization. So we're looking at what happens when everyone has access to the technology, what happens when everyone has access to the content. And um, what we saw with the Educa Educause pilot was that in the first half of the semester, with the same professor teaching a similar, the same course and a similar cohort of students, we saw a seven-point rise in per-student performance in the class. So if a kid was getting a 75 in the class, um, now they were getting an 82. So that's almost a full grade point. So we felt that that was substantial and something that we, really, uh, that we were really excited about. Um, the other thing is that we began to share some of our results with the rest of the country. And so last year we had our first annual Cyber Learning Summit, and we'll be hosting another Cyber Learning Summit um, actually February 6th and 7th. Um, so uh, again, we'll be sharing um, our results with the rest of the world. And then we started to look at this whole idea of digital publishing and looking at partnerships that we could use so that we could begin to kind of drive the conversation of what, how the content is being used and specifically what the content, um, how the content is being dr driven into the courses. So um, all of this led to the development of our, what we consider to be our future learning culture. And our vision is that we, want to see a complete digital ecosystem. Um, when, this is part of answering that basic question, what's the role of the institution in an environment where information is ubiquitous. So when information is everywhere, we have to move from being a gatekeeper of information to rather fostering uh, skills where students learn how to use existing information to create new knowledge. And so 
Um, part of that is through technology. Um, we have our one-to-one -one mobile learning platform. Um, looking at digital content, and I'll talk about this a little bit um, more specifically with our uh, with our, our strategy that we're using, and um, new teaching and learning spaces. And I'll talk about this a little bit more um, as well. Innovate is a new space that we are opening uh, next week, actually. Um, it is our one-stop shop for the creation and dissemination of all digital tools in the university. And um, I'll give you a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, our, the, everything about our program has to be about a curricular focus. So really looking at our focus on student learning objectives and also faculty evaluation. So that uh, teaching with technology strategy that faculty members wrote now becomes a part of their evaluation process. So they are writing a predictive instrument that starts to talk about how they will use this to be able to affect these student learning outcomes. And then during their evaluation, they're evaluated on their implementation of that strategy. And um, the, the final thing is that what we want to see is an enhanced learning culture. We want to see a learning culture that's inquiry-based, something that's very, very student-centered, that fosters intellectual curiosity and encourages lifelong learning. And so all of that is the way that we are changing direction and trying to really develop a 21st century learning community at Jackson State University. So um, I am going to switch now uh, to another presentation. And this is kind of looking at our plan of where do we move from here. So um, as you know, as I talked about before, cyber learning has basically three drivers. We have um, cyber learning, which is through the provost office. That's the part that, that I'm uh, in charge of. We have our partnership with the Mississippi E-Center, um, and then also information te technology. Um, so those three drivers actually turn into um, outputs that, that can happen in the classroom. So the Mississippi E-Center allows us to have a one-to-one -one initiative. Informat information technology gives the technology infrastructure so that we can really drive the program. And then cy cyber learning allows us to focus on student learning outcomes. So um, those outcomes, those drivers turn in, into outcomes in the classroom. So our one-to-one -one initiative allows us to have an environment of active learning in the classroom. And so um, that focuses on actually hands-on learning in the classroom and moving away from uh, the format of lecture to a format of really of student engagement and hands-on learning in the classroom. Um, uh -oh. The student learning objectives um, allow for the student creation of primary source material. So now we're focusing um, not just on uh, student access of information, but student creation of new material and new information, and how do they think in the discipline. And then finally, the technology infrastructure allows us to expand the bounds of the traditional classroom. Now we can bring the world into our classroom and share our classroom with the rest of the world. So in order to move from those drivers to those outcomes, we have this huge chasm in the middle, and that's the faculty. And so in order to give the faculty the, uh, the resources in order to be able to affect these outcomes that we want to see in the classroom, we've had to focus on um, new ways of engaging the faculty. And so the first thing is to develop a program for us that's interdisciplinary, that's collaborative, and that brings e-content into the picture. And so for us, we already had that mechanism. That was that Global Inquiry Faculty Teaching Seminar that we were talking about earlier. But GIFTS was a program, as I said before, that worked with 12 to 14 faculty members at a time. And um, it, it would take us too long to be able to implement something like that across the entire university. So when we looked at scaling up, we had to talk about how we could use the format of GIFTS to now spread across the entire university. 
So we developed what we called our Cyber Learning Council. And the Cyber Learning Council both worked on the content of e, the, uh, the, the development of e-content and the research group. So we're looking at how content comes into the classroom and then research on whether or not that content is being effective um, in, uh, in changing the, the student learning or, or actually being able to implement the student learning outcomes that we want to, uh, that we want to see. So um, that works on both sides and each the content the council works through the development of e-content and so our focus now is how do we embed what we're doing into the very nature of what happens in the classroom and we're doing that through developing the content ourselves. So we're moving from our drivers to our outcomes and this loop around that, that goes back and forth is the assessment of the whole part. So we have physical structures in Innovate and Create. Those are actually two physical spaces in the library that Innovate works with faculty to be able to develop new e-content. Create is a new center in the library where students will be able to participate in project-based learning. And so Create allows them to actually fulfill all of the curricular enhancements that we develop through Innovate. So uh, the first step in the process is opening Innovate. Innovate is the physical space that allows and the I'll, I'll actually to stop this because it's a movie. But um, but that's actually a we actually took the first floor of our library and built a digital intellectual commons. And so this digital space now allows for the creation and dissemination of digital products. So we've moved academic IT and distance learning into that space. And now faculty members have all the resources that they need. They have all of the equipment. They have all of the staffing to be able to develop any kind of digital product that they can imagine uh, for their courses. Uh, my pitch to the faculty was, all you need is a bad idea because faculty members would come to me and say, I would love to do a flipped classroom. I would love to podcast all my video, uh, podcast all my lectures. I would love to do all of these things in my class, but I don't have the resources to do it. I don't have the equipment to do it. I don't have the time to do it. So, and they would finally say, and you know, I'm just not sure that it's a great idea in the first place. Maybe it's not such a great idea. And I, my response to them is, all you need is a bad idea. You come to this place, you bring your idea, you have all of the faculty, all of the staffing, you have all the equipment, you have all the technology, and they'll take your idea and turn it into a fantastic idea. So now we're providing faculty members with the resources that they need so that now they can take advantage uh, of the expectations of, of this increased and heightened learning environment. So. Um, in order to start focusing on the development of e-content, we have some development partners. So our first partner was develop, was partnering with Apple in Education. Um, that's for the actual development of the e-books themselves. And so we're using iBook Author um, as, as our mechanism for developing uh, digital textbooks. And um, we're partnering, um, especially in science, uh, engineering, and technology, with the Shodor Educational Foundation in uh, building interactive materials that we can actually build into these digital books. Um, and for the production of this set of digital books, we're working with the group Words and Numbers. Um, they actually worked with uh, Rice University for the development of uh, of their uh, platform for uh, digital textbooks and they, they do much of the ghostwriting for uh, Prentice Hall and a number of other publishers. So um, we have a very aggressive implementation timetable. Time we are focused on full implementation of a set of general education uh, core textbooks that we have developed that will specifically focus on our student learning objectives. They will bring voices into the conversation that have been historically left out. And um, 
they what we're asking are three questions. We want to know why are we teaching these courses? What's the student learning objectives that we want to see happen? What is the content that we're going to use to drive those SLOs? And then finally, the question that I don't think it's asked enough in higher education, how? What's the pedagogy that we're going to use in order to really implement um, the, the content so that it drives the student learning objectives? So we started with um, departmental curriculum committees in the fall and uh, the opening and development of Innovate. We, and I hired an e-content coordinator. So now these groups, they don't have to worry. All they have to do is put their stuff together. They just need outlines. And uh, they do the same things that they would normally do in the classroom. And I have somebody that takes that and puts it into a digital book format. Um, we have now started with content development teams. And they're working through this new space, Innovate. And um, they're using our e-content coordinator to start building the tools that uh, are going to turn into these new uh, digital books that we'll use in the classroom. And during the summer, we go through the process of beta testing and peer review so that we're ready for full implementation in the fall of 2014. Um, and also, I've, I've kind of developed our own internal revenue, revenue structure for this. So um, we retain the same intellectual property rights that, uh, that we use for um, printed books. If a faculty member uh, publishes a book and it's printed form, it's the exact same intellectual property rights. Um, we have developed an 80-20 split between the college and the authors. So um, one of the things that I've done with this program is to bring down the costs of textbooks for students by over 90%. So um, as I was talking about, those five gen ed courses that freshmen take during their freshman years, the cost of textbooks are over $1,200. The digital books that we're producing, the, the ceiling for the cost of those books will be $10. So we're going to bring down the cost by over 90%. And that $10 that a student pays, 75% of it will come back to the university which actually comes back to the department that um, teaches the course. And there's an 80-20 split between the college and the authors. So now if you have, uh, for example, we have 2,000 students that take English 104 every semester. 75% of that $20,000 that's generated per semester comes back to the English department every semester. And now they can use those funds for anything that they want in the English department. They can use it for faculty development. They can use it for development of new digital tools, whatever they want. So um, it becomes an internal revenue structure for faculty members. And then an external revenue structure, because there are other universities that are looking to move into um, this kind of a learning environment. And so again, an 80-20 split between the university and the authors, but all of the revenue um, that comes from external sources um, comes back to the university. So now we have a process that moves from our drivers to our outcomes and focuses on high quality digital products that um, are based on our student learning objectives. And that is basically um, all that we're doing with cyber learning. So um, I think at this point I'm going to open it up for questions get out of this. And um, I'm going to hand it back over to Adrian. Okay, Robert, this is Sherry. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It was um, it's a very exciting initiative and you presented it in such clear steps. I'm, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed actually. Uh, fantastic. So I'm also going to open it up to Irma. Um, and what I'm going to do now is um, invite our uh, attendees, if you have any questions, please just write them in the um, chat box in the, in the corner. Do we have? Um, do you see it um, in the bottom? Uh, however, uh, there's a little arrow on the bottom. Just make sure it's sent to everybody, or at least uh, us. Um, 
But with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a question, if you, if it's then, you know, take, because uh, actually I've got quite a few of them, and then I'll also open Irma's, um, as our moderator, uh, to, 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 to work with you all. So the first one is, like I said, it was, uh, everything looked wonderful and smooth, but I do need to ask you if you actually faced or faced any challenges along the way and how you overcame that. Sure. Um, well, I, I actually, beginning this, I thought that I was going to be faced with some uh, hesitancy in the faculty, um, looking at uh, developing kind of a new um, learning culture at the university. Um, but once, because of the way that we rolled out our strategy, because it was cohort-based, and we were moving with one cohort at a time, we actually implemented in a way that um, uh, actually uh, what I call it is the why not me syndrome. So because we uh, implemented with 100 faculty members at a time, and we started with the faculty members that teach those five gen ed courses, what, I, what happened was that I had faculty members that came from all over the university saying, oh, well, I teach another freshman course as well. And I had to say, well, we're not really start. We're starting with these five, and then we're spreading from there. So what it did was it actually um, built a little bit of a system where we had a cohort of faculty members that were um, almost being seen as our all-stars. And this, these are ways that these people are enhancing their classroom environment. And um, what it did was it created almost a, a competitive environment where other faculty members uh, were wanted to be a part of that. So um, it has um, led to some very exciting things for us. Um, this year we were named as um, an Apple Distinguished School, one of only five in the country. And um, that has given our program lots of prestige. We've got lots of outside attention. And um, it's given more impetus for our faculty to um, get on board and to really become a part of the process. Um, the other thing is that, uh, that the, 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 the students actually become the drivers in this kind of environment. And so what that means is that faculty members have to move from being the uh, sage on the stage with all the person with all the information now to being a facilitator of, of student learning. And it's a very different process for faculty members. So again, providing the resources for faculty members to transition in their teaching so that they can lead students through this very kind of inquiry-based um, active learning, project learning um, environment, um, part of that has been building the resources for faculty members to be able to use those tools. Um, do you want me to chime in, uh, Sherry, with some questions as well? Yes, um, actually, let me ask you a question. Irma, can you see, we actually have a number of questions that have been generated. Can you see them, or are they only showing up on our side? I know Adrian started to transfer them over into the wide chat box, but I want to see if you can do it. Can you I see them? Only, I can only see the one, how are you staffing Innovate? That's the only okay. one I can see. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we do, why don't you, if it makes sense, rather than typing all the new questions in, why don't I pass it to you to ask a question, and then I'll take it back and ask the questions that have come to us. Okay. Is that perfect. all right? Sounds okay. great. great. And that way, um, I'll raise some questions also to get the, everybody's juices flowing in the meantime. So um, I was really uh, very interested in how you build the, a revenue model that is encouraging this entrepreneurial participation for the faculty, which was one of my questions, how do you incentivize faculty participation? So actually, I think the existence of the revenue model kind of answers that question. But are some of the professors considering perhaps publishing this material even as a, a collection of, uh, of materials, maybe uh, as a monograph, uh, kind of like a, um, a research monograph in terms of how you can uh, put forward an initiative of this sort. You know, right. I can see that the other universities would also be interested in the material. So not only within the university, but also outside the university. Absolutely. 
And um, one of the because we have this large initiative that we're focused on right now with the general education core, we're actually looking at ten courses for the fall that we're focusing on developing content for. But we still have the same process that we've had going along the whole time with the Global Inquiry Faculty Teaching Seminar. And so that's the environment where faculty members can come in. Um, I actually pay them a summer school salary. So they're, they're paid to work for one summer session to develop this content that they're going to use in their course. And it can be in the form of a monograph. It can be in the form of a digital textbook. The, the whole point of it, though, is that it's a way of engaging students through active learning in the classroom, through using technology to expand the bounds of the traditional course, and to have students creating their own primary source material. So um, as long as they're within those three big goals, um, our three pillars, um, we have faculty members that are, that are moving in that direction, both on an independent basis and then as these large kind of departmental initiatives as well. That's phenomenal. Uh, one question, Robert. How do you ensure the quality of the e-books right. that are generated? Yeah. So everything is peer reviewed. Um, oh, okay. We had faculty members, the faculty members that came through GIFTS, uh, the Global Inquiry Faculty Teaching Seminar, um, once they finished their book, they finished during the second summer session. And for us, that's, uh, they, they go through the months of July and August. Um, classes start for us at the end of August, so they actually beta test their book in their class and go through the peer review process at the same time. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the benefits of the digital textbooks are that as we make changes to the book, um, the faculty make, member can make changes to their book and it actually updates all of the books that are in, that their students have. So we can make revisions on the fly and it's a dynamic system. So now all of the, the textbooks that are in the classroom are being revised at the same time as well. So, um, so what that means is that um, as the faculty member is beta testing their book, they're, they're going through the peer review process at the same time. That usually lasts for two semesters and then at the end of that period they come up for um, publish, publication. And we actually submit the book for publication just like a printed book. It, um, it gets an ISBN number, just like a printed book, and it counts for tenure and promotion on our side. Oh, so now, yeah, yeah, so now it becomes an incentive for faculty members when you start to look at the whole tenure and promotion uh, process as, as well. Because it's the same process as, as writing a, a book that you would um, for any other classroom system. It's just that now it's in a digital format. Yeah, I think that that is a phenomenal outcome as well because essentially all your faculty, including teaching faculty, are now even more engaged in in publishing uh, mm -hmm. their uh, materials and and I think uh, that that has to have a tremendous positive impact and the fact that you're recognizing it in the tenure and promotion, I think it's phenomenal. Uh, there was a question from the audience, how are you staffing Innovate? Um, we had the, the, the system that we had before was we had an office of distance learning and then had a director and a staff that was in one part of campus. And then we had an, um, an office of what we call academic IT that was actually in a separate um, campus uh, that has its own director and staff. And so if a faculty member wanted to do anything, they could have done something like this before, but they would have had to go between several different locations. They would have had to find the people that they needed. It was the, the system that we had actually provided barriers, hindrances to the process of uh, being able to provide the content that we wanted. So what we did was actually we just took the staff from distance learning and academic IT, built the infrastructure for Innovate, and then moved them into that space. So it was resources that we already had. We just wanted to have a more efficient way of using it so that we developed what I like to call a one-stop shop. So now all you have to do, if I'm doing anything in a digital environment, I know that I just go to Innovate. All I have to do is go to that one place, and um, everything that I need 
in order to be able to achieve um, a project that I want to implement in my classroom uh, can all happen in that one space. Um, I have a, a question that here that was presented by uh, one of the, um, uh, the participants. Uh, one of the things you shared with us, Robert, is that, that your school uh, is an Apple Distinguished School, and I think that that was probably a, a crucial decision that you all made at Jackson State. Mm -hmm. um, but it, what would be the advantage or disadvantage? In your case, you know, you made a, a decision, you, an Apple Distinguished School, but you could have also chosen to be platform agnostic. Right. Uh, what would be the advantages or disadvantages of going either way, uh, picking right. one specific platform or being platform agnostic? The, the reason for us to use one specific platform goes all the way back to um, the first implementation that we used. And um, with the, the BYOD strategy that we had, that was a platform agnostic um, uh, implementation. And what that meant was that um, it really, um, we, we were providing, what we did was we, we set up, as I said before, our own digital divide. Because students were using their own devices, we were trying, the first books that we used were EPUBs. They were, um, it, they were platform agnostic. You could use them in any platform. And, um, but because we were using students' resources, um, we saw that we were actually making the system unequal for students. And so when we said that we wanted to provide a democratic environment, we had to decide one platform that was going to be the overall platform for everything that we did because we wanted to be able to provide a platform where we could provide every single student with the same amount of access. That meant that they all had to be able to have the same kinds of devices. And then also an environment where we could develop content that we knew was going to work on all the devices that we had. And so for us, the strategy was to pick a platform and to run with it. So um, that was really our reasoning for using one platform. Um, at the time that we implemented, um, Apple was the biggest player out there, and they were the, um, one of the first players to really get into educational learning environments um, with um, all of the tools that they had available in iTunes U. And so yeah. that provided a big impetus for us to use that platform. Yeah, certainly made it a lot easier. Would you be willing, uh, Robert, to share the structure of your gift seminar? Some of our participants would like to learn a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, so the way that gifts works is it's a um, it's a one month seminar. Uh, faculty members are working. They're in class actually from Monday through Thursday, and then Friday is a writing day. And what I do is I structure the seminar so that the first week we actually work on um, uh, educational strategy. Um, uh, so we develop a scaffolding lesson plan for their, um, for their course. And I, what I do is I bring in facilitators from all over the country. So uh, for the past few years, I've brought in uh, Rebecca Nowacek from uh, Marquette University, and she's um, her research interest is looking at learning transfer, how students take information that they have in one setting and transfer it to another. And so, um, and we, and the, the, the faculty members, before GIFT starts, we have a pretty substantial uh, reading list that they have to complete. And then they have a reading journal that they, uh, a, a, that's kind of a blog site for the course where they're, talking about how this reading affects their understanding of curriculum and how that would work in their course. So the first thing that happens is that we have this, what we call our spring reading seminar, um, and so, or, or rather reading circle. Um, so during that reading circle time, they have a number of texts that both look at course design, um, instructional strategy, and also the analytical exercises, these big questions about the world. And so they kind of had an understanding or a broad understanding of maybe how all of these pieces might work in their course by the time they arrive at GIFTS. And then during the first week, 
we develop the structure, um, and I bring in a facilitate. I bring in a couple of facilitators during that first week. They'll they'll be in sessions with the facilitators. They'll ask questions, and um, what I try and do is I set try to set up an environment of um, uh, intellectual jousting. I like to call it. We are really kind of battling with some of these issues and what the student learning outcomes mean and how that manifests itself in our courses. And so it becomes a very active um, uh, co collaborative process with the faculty. And so they go through each week and each week has a different topic. So we'll, the second week, we'll start to focus on analytical exercises. The third week, we'll actually look at um, book design, and we'll start plugging in the pieces of their books, um, and, and also start to look at um, uh, learning tools that are built into the book. So um, some virtual learning tools. Um, in iBook Author, they're called widgets, but they're basically learning tools that can focus on a big concept that students might have a difficult time understanding, and this learning tool brings it into a, a really kind of focused way of understanding. And, um, and then uh, each week um, on the Thursday, uh, the Thursday class day, faculty members present for each other. And so they give a presentation of everything that they're working on. And so it, again, becomes a collaborative process because now the faculty members are discussing with each other and um, they end up learning from each other. So the English professor learns from the biology professor and the biology professor learns from the sociology professor. And it becomes this very um, collaborative and rich environment where faculty members that might have been kind of uh, insulated in one department and don't know people outside of, of their discipline, um, yeah. they get all of this interaction uh, between the rest of the disciplines. And it becomes a very rich learning environment for the faculty as well. That's wonderful. Um, one of the participants wanted to hear a little bit more about how did you address accessibility of the technology mm. during the training for instructors and students? Right. So one, uh, another reason that we went with Apple as a platform was because um, accessibility is built into um, the, uh, the Apple infrastructure. So um, one of the things that we do is, uh, as a part of the book, is we make sure that all of the accessibility tools are built into the book. So um, we have books that blind students can use, deaf students can use. Um, it, if you um, have some disability, motor, uh, motor disability, um, all, of those, all of those tools are actually built into the device. And so um, it then means that all of the content that we develop is accessible for students on, on, on a number of different levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, Sherry, do you have any other questions that you would like to um, Ask uh, Robert. I, actually, uh, just one more. I mean, yeah. Unless you have, we, I think we have time for one more question. One more. I, I think, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think we've gone through the number of the questions we had. People asked overlapping ones, and we just tried to combine them. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the only last question I had is, I have to say, I'm so impressed at how fast you're moving this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and, uh, and any insights on how to um, move a university faster? Right. Well, um, we have a very dynamic president who um, does not tolerate what she calls slow walking. <laughs> so um, what that means is that um, everything, literally everything, we, we, we're very careful about how we implement and study pretty heavily before we implement anything. But once we reach the implementation stage, it's all about execution. So for example, with the Innovate space, um, I pitched that space and that, uh, that whole infrastructure to our provost in June this past summer. And um, at the end of the month, I presented to President's Council and um, I presented at 8 o'clock in the morning. By 4 o'clock that afternoon, I had all the funding. And we're opening the facility 
now in January. So in the, you know, in the academic world, that's like a nanosecond. So um, really, <laughs> yeah, it, it all came from um, the, the uh, administrative um, impetus. Our, our, our president says that we, she, do, she just doesn't tolerate. If we see something is working and this is a direction we want to move in, she says, let's make it happen. So. That is wonderful. Um, I think that that com pretty much concludes the time that we have for the webinar, correct, Sherry? It does. Um, so if you want to complete, and then what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll end it with, yes. hello? Yes. Huh. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know what um, happened, but everything seems to be fine. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Robert Blaine, we are so thankful for you spending the time to share with us this wonderful initiative, the iPad initiative. It really has accomplished its goals of democratizing uh, learning uh, in the in the new cyber era, but I think uh, for sure in the engagement of your faculty and your students has translated into a much richer environment and, uh, and much richer ecosystem for your students to succeed and we certainly congratulate you for that. So I want to turn it over to Sherry with a deep thank, thanks and our gratitude for sharing your insights with us. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll echo Irma's gratitude. I think you really had a fabulous presentation. I mean, you started with the big picture and the big question that we're all dealing with and really scoped out how you addressed it, what you did, how you thought about it. I mean, it's, a, it's a, literally a fantastic roadmap for anyone else thinking of it. And, and honestly, Robert, I think the name for your book is, you know, Come With a Bad Idea. <laughs> but um, so with that, thank you. So I'll just end it with uh, I'll thank everyone for joining uh, um, the webinar series, which is part of the USU Student Performance Strand at USU. We'll be having our next webinar at February twenty uh, February twenty eighth at one o'clock, which is building college resilience through supportive message messaging. Uh, another um, actually, it's going to be another fabulous presentation like this one. Um, it's a, an effort that's actually been highlighted in a lot of the, the media, social Stanford innovation, et cetera. So I think it'll be um, a really exciting one, just as, um, although they've got a high bar after this one, but I'm sure they'll deliver it. Um, and uh, also look in your email boxes. We've, we're going to actually have another USU opportunity next week in which we're going to be hearing about um, the uh, National Academy studies on barriers um, and challenges to STEM education. So and with Sherry, that, this uh, conference, like, uh, real quick, Sherry, the webinar is it was being recorded, so you're going to actually uh, archive it on the USU website together with a PowerPoint, correct? Yes, we are. Is that okay yes. with Robert? Yes. Yes, that's great. Okay. Thank yes, you. we will. Um, so we will we will share all of the things that we have. Um, and uh, again, I'd like to thank Robert and Irma for um, for their great work today. And I'd like to thank everyone else for attending. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.